All right. Good morning. I am glad to be here. I'm excited. Before I get started, though, I need to take this opportunity that I have a microphone in front of you guys and brag on the students of this church uh, just for a short amount of time. Uh, I am the youth pastor here, and what I mainly do is work with the teenagers and the students. And we have such amazing students in our church uh, and in our community here. Just recently, we went to youth convention. Every year following youth convention, we spend four or five weeks where we do a big push um, to sacrifice things we have, uh, to sell things, to do whatever it is, uh, to work a few extra shifts, babysitting, or, or whatever the teenagers are doing, uh, to give that money to projects that we have. Um, we took pledges a couple weeks ago of what they really felt like God was laying on those students' hearts to give. And it was amazing as these pledges came in. And the next morning, I sat there and counted them. And my first reaction to what our group's pledge was, was there's no way this ha is happening. But I had to kind of stop and, and just have this moment of, okay, God, you know what? Rebuke me if I ever doubt what you can do through teenagers. So our students here, they pledge $35,000 just about <laughs> over the next five weeks. And here's what I would say to you. We challenged them this last week with the story of the boy with five loaves and two fishes. There's no way that should feed 5,000 people. But the truth is, is no matter what you have, whether it's five loaves and two fishes or $5 or a job that you can make money at, what you have plus God is enough. So we're believing for some amazing things. Yes, you, you can clap because I love our teenagers. That's, that's, they're, they're doing amazing things. So here's what I would challenge you with, church. Find one of our students, talk with them, or if they come up and start talking to you, don't immediately write them off as the crazy teenager that's going to break things. But spend some time listening to their heart and what they're trying to do. Because they're trying to raise money for, we have two projects. One is to build water wells in Af Africa. And what's going to happen is right next to the well is going to be a church that's built. People travel for miles to get clean drinking water. And when they travel there, they're going to be right on the front steps of a church. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? It's not just meeting one need. It's not just giving them water. It's not just giving them Jesus. It is doing, meeting both of their needs uh, that they that are huge in their life. The second thing is we're working with, um, it's called Free International, and it is a human trafficking organization that is trying to stop sex trafficking uh, specifically uh, all across the U.S. And they are trying to raise money for a command center at the Super Bowl this year. You would not believe when you start to hear the statistics of how many people are sold at our Super Bowl here in America. It's absolutely shocking, and it's happening right underneath our noses. So we are raising money to help them start this command center. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Terrence Talley from Minnesota that works with them uh, that was at our convention and sharing that. So these students have just got a, just a passion uh, to sacrifice what they have. I mean, we have kids that are selling stuff. We have kids that are uh, all sorts of different things because they just believe that, you know what, when God starts to give me a dream, Amazing things can happen. And nothing else is coming before that in their lives. So I just encourage you guys, spend some time uh, listening to those students and hearing kind of what is going on in their life. Um, because it's, it's amazing. It absolutely is. So anyways, if you have missed the last month at our church here, uh, Pastor Thor had been going through a stressed out series. I know for me, it was huge. Uh, I got to hear some pretty amazing ways to deal with stress. We all have stress in our life. We all have it. None of us want it. How do we get rid of it? If you missed those messages, go back, listen to them. They were very practical. Uh, and Pastor Mac finished that series up last week. And as we said, Pastor Thor is back next week starting a new, or well, first doing questions and kind of launching that into a new series. So we are here at this in-between week where they dangerously hand the youth, pass, the youth pastor the microphone. And that's where we are this week. But I'm really excited. Uh, as we talked about what, what we felt like God wanted to say, we've been starting to notice something in our church here. I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but I have. Over the last month or a couple months here, there's just a little bit more of an added hunger for God's presence. There's been a few weeks where 
we just have been spending a few more minutes, a little while longer at the altar, been pressing in a little more, going after God a little more openly during worship. And I'm starting to see just this hunger inside of our church for God. And that's such a great thing, but there's a danger that we have to realize, and that is that needs to continue when we walk out these doors. That can't just stay inside these four walls, because if it does, we're going to die. So it's been amazing to watch as, as this has been happening. We've been talking about it as a staff, and in our staff meetings on Tuesday mornings, uh, one of the... Uh, people in the staff meeting always shares a devotional. We kind of rotate it through the week, and you see you're on for next week. And for me, uh, I have a devotional book that uh, Emily and I have both bought. It's called Live Dead Joy. It's written by Dick Brogdon. He's a missionary that heads up uh, this Live Dead initiative. And it's all about um, this team of missionaries that are living in the Middle East, and basically they've gone there with the idea, I'm going to die. I'm going there, and there's a good chance that myself, my significant other, and my family may not come back. And that takes a whole other mindset and perspective to take that step, uh, one that I know I would definitely struggle with. So reading through this book, uh, written by people with this different perspective, for me has just kind of been kicking me in the pants, because it, it's tough. I'm sitting there, and every single day, I'm like, okay, God, I will, I'll try and do better. I'll try and do better. And it is, it's one of the hardest things, but I shared a devotional um, and I'm going to share part of that devotional this morning as well from the book in our staff meeting on the October 20th. And it was called To Give or Give Up. And the whole premise behind it was giving extravagant time to Jesus. See, time is honestly many times more valuable in our life than money is. Time is one of the hardest things for us to be willing to give up. And this devotional just started talking through that. And uh, as I was reading this and as pastors we were discussing this, it kind of just sparked this curiosity. I mean, I started doing some research. How many of you guys like statistics? Like you like hearing like crazy numbers? Like, oh, okay. There's a few of us. Those of us that like them, we are in love with them. The rest of you guys, well, try and get something out of this. Because these numbers are just, <laughs> it's insane. There are some large case studies. Uh, obviously, they did not call every person in America because I'm sure none of you guys got a phone call asking these questions. But they did this case study several times and got very similar numbers almost every time. So what that tells us is this is a very good representation of our country as a whole. As they called all around kind of the country, different demographics, different uh, income levels, all sorts of different things. And this is some of the things that they found out. 88% of the respondents owned a Bible. That actually kind of surprises me. I would not have thought that the number that were that high. Actually, the average of Bibles per household was 4.4 Bibles. So four Bibles and a little New Testament. No, it's not a little New Testament. It's, you know, obviously an average. But that's crazy. I never would have thought 4.4 Bibles per household. 88% own Bibles. 80% of the people consider the Bible a sacred text. Now, for some of us, we'd be like, well, America definitely isn't living like it's a sacred text. And, you know, yes, that may be true, but that's, this is truly what people believe. 80% actually believe that the Bible is a sacred text. One third of people asked said that they thought the moral decline of America was specifically because of people not reading their Bible. And yet, less than 20%, now this changes, this is not just the Americans they call, this is churchgoers, us. Less than 20% of churchgoers read their Bible daily. So I don't know about you, but as I start to like look at those numbers, in my head I start to think this doesn't add up. And not just like the percentages, but just, I mean, America has a problem, we realize that, the world has a problem, the American church has a problem. We as Christians have many problems. We know what the answer to those problems are. We know that we can fix those problems. I mean, that's even people that don't go to church are saying the same thing. We know what the answer is. 
The answer is sitting on the shelf in our house, and yet it remains on the shelf in our house. The really sad part of some of these studies was they did one on specifically just pastors. And they found it wasn't just churchgoers. 72% of pastors that they had asked, uh, this was from a several different conferences of pastors, 72% of them did not open their Bible outside of sermon prep. I heard an audible gasp in the room, and that seriously was my response. That is crazy. We know how God speaks to us. We have so many people walking around saying, God, just speak to me. I'm open. I want to listen. I want to do what you want. Speak to me. And we leave the Bible sitting on the shelf. The number one way that God speaks to us is written word. And it's not a lack of availability. Like we said, 4.4 on average per house. There's over 100 English translations of the Bible. It's not a lack of availability. There are people in this world that their reason is, is a lack of availability. And when they get a Bible, they spend time memorizing that Bible because they know they have to pass it on to someone else so they can hear that truth. Well, we in somewhat typical American fashion have four of them sitting on our shelf. This may seem like I'm going off track, but I'm not. Bear with me. How many of you guys have ever gone swimming in a deep pool or lake? You know, like whether it's as a kid or maybe recently. Do you guys ever try and do the thing? You jump in and you try and be cool and swim to the bottom. Like, yeah, look at me. I'm swimming all the way to the bottom. And like, I always thought I was real cool and I'd get down there and I'd kind of sit like crisscross applesauce on the bottom of the pool. And like, oh, I wonder if the lifeguard thinks I'm drowning. <laughs> That was always probably really mean to the lifeguards. But I'd sit down there. But then when you do that, if you've done this, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. As you sit there, all of a sudden you start to realize, I don't have as much air as when I first jumped in. And I'm starting to feel this air disappear. So you immediately start swimming towards the surface. And you start swimming, and you swim a little faster, and a little faster, and a little faster, and pretty soon you're feeling like there's no way I'm going to make it. My lungs are about to explode. I'm going to die. That's just where I'm at. I'm going to die. And you swim as fast as you can, and you finally break through the surface of the water, and you take this huge breath of air, and you're like, okay, I'm alive. Even though a quarter of a second ago, I thought I was dead. I'm alive. This is great. God is our air supply. And the problem is, is as humans, we can hold our breath. You see, we can walk out these doors and not stay connected to our air supply, and there's not immediate ramifications where we're just going to die. And that's a problem, because we start to get comfortable holding our breath. Instead of spending time connected to our air supply... We just hold our breath, and we do it all week long. And Monday's all right, Tuesday's all right, Wednesday, maybe we're starting to feel the pressure. By Friday night, we feel like our lungs are going to explode, and then we walk through the doors, we take a big breath of air, and then when we leave, we just hold our breath and walk out again. We know what the fix is to so many of these problems, and yet we continue to just do it all over again. We need to have that constant air supply. So I've, I've been talking a lot about the Bible, so I think we should probably actually look at the Bible. Some of you guys are like, it's about time. All right, we're going to look in the book of Matthew. That's the very first book in the New Testament, if you don't know what that is. Um, first four of the Gospels, you can open up to that if you have your paper Bible, if you have an electronic Bible. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 today. We're going to be reading from verse 6 through 16. All right, so when we look at this, there are, uh, this is actually the the verses that my devotional that I had shared in the staff meeting that really led to uh, a lot of uh, us talking about this uh, from that devotional book, this is the, the text that that book was looking at. So when we look at this, we see two opposing stories here. We see one story of a woman that gives her entire life savings, basically, and pours it out on Jesus. That's one story. And then immediately following that, we have this other story 
of a man who gives up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Such opposing stories right next to each other. So let's look at that starting in verse 6. If you don't have your Bible, it will be on the screen behind me. We're reading in the New Living Translation. Verse 6, Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. Now, expensive isn't just like, oh, you know, I spent $40 on this. I mean, like, when you start digging into this, this perfume was ridiculous, the amount. It was life savings. Its value was equal to almost like an entire year's wages, um, is what's said. So she pours this entire thing over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. They said, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this reply, or aware of this, replied, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for, bur for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. This, is a, this story is actually one of the few that's in all four Gospels. We're going to verse 14. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him thirty pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I hear the name Judas, I just kind of cringe a little bit. When I start to read that, I'm just like, oh, I do not like him. And unfortunately, there's been other people in the Bible named Judas, and I have the same reaction when I read their name, which is just because I, I hear that name, and I just automatically associate it with this terrible person. But I think why this passage hit me so hard when I was reading through this devotional, and, and, and they really put it into a new perspective for me, is because they said, you know what? If you have to put yourself in these two people's shoes, where do you fall? And the truth is, is that when I look at that, even though Judas is incredibly high on the list of people I do not want to be like, basically goes Satan and then Judas from people from the Bible, I don't want to be associated with Judas, but when I have to be honest with myself, I probably lean more in one direction than the other. I would love to say that I'm constantly just pouring out my entire life for Jesus. But that's just not the truth. And I think that when we start to realize this, when we start to kind of look at it, we realize that, you know what, every single day, every one of us has a choice. Are we going to give time extravagantly to Jesus? Or are we going to give him up? Now, I've never given up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but if I were honest before you guys this morning, I have given him up for an extra hour of sleep. I've given him up for one more episode of a TV show on Netflix. I've given him up to watch a football game. You see... We need to learn how to manage our time. And we learn, need to learn how to have priorities. You know, I think part of it is sometimes we even go as far as justifying what we're doing. Maybe we're like, you know what, I need to spend more time at work because I need to make a little bit more money. Not because I'm selfish, but because I need to provide for my family. Because I need to make a house payment. Because I want to be able to give more at church. Because I want to do this. And we justify it. Or maybe, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend more time serving at the church because, man, I, I just love this ministry and I want to serve there. And, hey, I'm doing it for Jesus, so that should count. But the truth is, is we're spending all of our time serving a ministry instead of spending time with Jesus. Or maybe even we're going as far as, hey, you know what, I, I, I want to spend more time with, with unbelievers. You know, we need to be reaching our world. 
all of these things. We, we have commandments to be doing this, to be, to be giving to the poor, to be providing for our family, to be spending time with unbelievers. I want to spend time with Christians so that I can grow as a Christian. I want to spend time with my family. And all of these are great. All of them are incredibly great. But not when they take the place that Jesus rightfully deserves. You see, when, when the disciples got upset when this lady poured the perfume over, it's not like they were saying, hey, why would you do that? You could have given it to me. I at least could have sold it and had some extra money. They're saying, we could have sold that and given it to the poor. We're commanded to give to the poor and to the needy. Jesus talks about this. And so what they wanted to do was a very good thing. But it wasn't the best thing that could have happened with it. It wasn't as great as pouring it out on Jesus. The, this devotional book, The Live Dead Joy, uh, one of the spots in there, it reads this. It says, when Jesus is precious to us, we give him our best. We give up other things, we prioritize him in our schedule, and we linger in his presence daily. Other choices, like when we get up and when we go to bed, how we spend our time, what we say no to, and what we prioritize, undergird our responses to Jesus. You see, we criticize Judas in this story because he gave up Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But the truth is, is our story, more often than not, is more like his than what we would like to admit. We betray Jesus constantly sometimes. Many times for things a lot worse than 30 pieces of silver. You know, most often our betrayal comes in the form of false intimacy. You see, we, we come into church on a Sunday morning and we say, I'm giving up this time for God. I want to be here in your presence. God, I want to spend this time with you. I'm going to spend time at the altar. And then we walk out of here and we're unchanged. We're the exact same person and we're untouched by God. And there's this false intimacy. You know, and, and it's honestly, it's, it's kind of fitting to say false intimacy because we look at how Judas betrayed Jesus. He betrayed him with a kiss very intimate thing. And when I read that, every time I read it, it just kind of tears at me when we see Jesus in the garden and, and Judas comes up to him and, and kisses him on his cheek. And we all know what he's signifying with that. And it's so hard because it's like this thing that's supposed to be intimate and important and special, you're using to betray our Savior and our Lord. I don't know about you, but every time I read it, I get a little bit of this just righteous anger building up inside of me. The line in this devotional book that was just kind of the final uppercut to the gut for me. You know, I already was feeling like, okay, man, I just, I, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way when I finish reading this, but not always. There's encouraging moments too. But this line that I'm sitting there, and, and it just kind of was the final, the final straw, said this. When we claim with our mouths that Jesus is supreme, but we do not live that commitment in the moments and hours of our day, we stand with Judas and kiss the Savior. I remember reading that, and it just tore me apart. Because I'm a very visual person, and as I read that, I can picture Judas standing there. Leaning in to kiss my Lord and Savior so that he can be betrayed and sent to his death and be beaten and tortured. And I started to visualize myself doing the same thing. And it just hit me so hard. Church, I don't know about you, but I need more and more of Jesus every single day. I need more Jesus today than I did yesterday, and I'm going to need more tomorrow than I do today. And not that I need more healings, or I need more blessings, or I need more favors. I just need more of His presence in my life. You know, too often we fall into the trap of every time we come to spend time with Jesus, it's so that we can get something in return. The truth is, we need to be at that point where when we come to Jesus, all we want is just more of Him. Nothing else. No gain for ourselves. No other agenda than just 
here I am, Lord. Take everything, everything that I am. Maybe you're here today and you've never actually made that commitment. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. We're going to spend time at the end here on purpose. We, we're going to have extra time. We'll have people up front that I want you to come and pray with them. If you want to take that step, I want you to physically get out of your seat and you're going to move up there and you're going to pray with them. I know that sounds intimidating, but this is why. Because we are not meant to do this alone. We're never meant to walk through this life alone. I can sit at home any day of the week and listen to any preacher on YouTube. I can sit at home and listen to an amazing worship band and sing along on YouTube. What I can't do is spend time with the body of Christ. I can't be built up. I can't be encouraged. I can't be corrected. We need each other. And that's why, if you want to make that decision a little bit later, we'll tell you when. I want you to physically move up and pray with somebody. Tell them where you're at. Tell them what you need in your life. And they're going to pray with you. Now, I think for the rest of us, it's kind of this, okay, well, where do I begin? So maybe I'm not spending enough time with Jesus. Where do I begin? Because the truth is, we know it's not just coming on Sundays. Right? We know that coming in here and listening to a pastor, whether it's Pastor Thor, Pastor Mac, myself, whoever it is, that is not going to be all you need. That doesn't even change us. No pastor ever in the history of the world, including Billy Graham, don't get too mad at me, has ever changed any person. Only God changes people. Only God changes lives. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I want to be changed, I want to do something in my life, you better believe that it starts with doing more than just coming on a Sunday. Because if that's, if that's all you're currently doing, you're not going to see change in your life. I had a, a conversation with a student last week, and, and we were just talking about different things, and, and he, he was very concerned. He said, well, what if a pastor is preaching incorrect things, and they're preaching it to hundreds of people, and they're believing him? I said, well, the truth is, is pastors are human. But I said, we aren't supposed to be changing you. We aren't supposed to be setting your theology. We're supposed to be starting conversations. We're supposed to be sparking things that you want to learn. We're supposed to be challenging, encouraging and then you leave and you go home and you spend time in God's word. The only infallible thing on this planet. And you spend time in God's word and you learn and you dig. Because as much as we want to change anybody, we can't. So I think for the rest of us, we have to make a decision. We have to be very intentional about carving out time to spend with Jesus. If you're just going to say, well, I'm just going to look for more time throughout my day and do it, it won't happen. I mean, at least for me, I've tried that. It's never happened in my life. I need to find specific time to spend with Jesus. And the best time. Not the time that's like five minutes before you go to bed and you wake up the next morning with your head in your Bible and there's just a massive drool spot right there in 2 Timothy. You're like, well, I didn't need to read that anyways. I used, to, I used to do that. I'd fall asleep praying or reading my Bible and I had, Jesus spoke to me one day. He just said, you can't do that. He said, have you, have you ever looked at anything in the Bible? Do you remember how people sacrificed? They didn't bring their three-legged sheep that was blind and had spots all over it. They brought the best. And God said, when are you going to start giving me your best time? Not the leftover time at the end of the day when you're half asleep. When are you actually going to start giving me your best time? When are you actually going to start making me a priority instead of trading me for more sleep? When are you going to start just pressing in towards my presence? Maybe for some of us, it's just a practical aspect. Hey, you know what? I, I can manage my time. I can do that. I can, char I can carve out some, a chunk of time, but I have no idea where to begin. Maybe you're like me when I was a kid, where every time I'd go to read my Bible, I'd just take the Bible, open it. I'd like put my finger somewhere in the Bible and just start reading there. And I was always convinced that God was going to speak to me through that because, hey, God's moving my finger. He's opening the pages. 
not a great way to do it. Quite honestly, for me at least, it was just because I was flat out lazy. I wasn't willing to go out and, and mark down what I'm going to read and how much I'm going to read and, and the times that I was going to do it. I'd encourage you with, find a devotional book. There are many devotional books out there. Now, a devotional book never holds the weight that Scripture does. Don't ever make that mistake. Scripture is the only thing that can do that. But find a devotional book that can help you look at Scripture in a new way. They can tell you what scriptures to be reading and maybe take you through the Bible in a year. Maybe you want to download the YouVersion app. It's a Bible you can have on your phone or, or anything like that. It has reading plans right in there. If you didn't know that, you can go to plans. You can select all sorts of plans. They have going through the Bible chronologically, going through the Bible this way, going through the Bible backwards. I, you know, follow what Chris Tomlin's doing in his devotion. You know, they just give you stuff to read. Or there's other, 29 Plans is an app that gives you, it gives you scripture to read. It gives you um, a song to listen to that goes along with that scripture. It go, it's built right into the app. It gives you something to pray for, something to journal about. It just takes your life and starts diving into the word. You can do the Live Dead Joy that, that I, I've, I've bought the book for, no, I got the book for a present. I bought the, the electronic one for like $2. There's an older book by Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. Amazing devotional book. It's written way long ago and people still use it. But we need to make that decision and actually put some steps to that decision. I need to spend more time with Jesus. I know what the problem is in my life. I know what the solution is. Statistics say I have 4.4 of them in my house. I just need to find some time and I need to open it and I need to read it. I need to press in towards Jesus with no other agenda than just God, fill me. Pull everything out of me that you don't want and just fill me. So we're going to do this today. We have a few minutes left here. And here's what I'd challenge you with. We have six minutes left. We finish at noon. I'll come up and pray, but I'd even encourage you guys, maybe you need to spend even a little bit more time this morning. If you have kids that are somewhere in a ministry, you know what? Your kids will understand when you go to them and say, hey, I love you. I'm sorry I'm late, but I was spending time with my Savior, and there's nothing more important than doing that. And let me tell you this. As someone who works with kids and teenagers, they will see your example and they will follow your example. So let's do this this morning. If I could have a couple of my prayer team that's gonna come up towards the front here. If you have never made this decision to give your life over to Jesus, I think it starts this morning. What I want you to do is I want you to come up and pray with any of the people that are gonna be up here in the front. I think for the rest of us, we need to just spend some time in the presence of of our Lord. That may look different for everybody. You may stay in your chair. Maybe you like your chair. You may get up and move. You may come up to the altar. I don't know. I'm a person that needs to move. When I pray, I walk. If I don't walk, I get distracted. One of the pastors I listen to says this. He says, change of place, change of pace equals change of perspective. I think all of us would agree that we probably all need a new perspective daily. So I'd encourage you guys, whatever you need to do, if you're opening your Bible right now and you're going to start reading right now, you're going to go find a plan right now. You're just going to sing a new song to him. You're going to sing along with the worship team. It doesn't matter. But we need to just spend some time pressing in towards Jesus. I'll come back up. I'll pray and close us out and we'll be dismissed. But right now, there's nothing else that you need to be thinking about, worrying about, or doing than just pressing in towards Jesus.